that. Uh, some of those, it looks like, you know, some people have been doing that Facebook challenge where they take a picture from, you know, 2009 and a picture from 2019 and to compare. Looks like some of you need to update. <laughs> but maybe if I looked like you do now, I would leave it like this too. I don't know. I'm actually going against everything I want to accomplish in this lesson this afternoon. <laughs> Thank God for our deacons. Now, you just ignore everything I've already said about this, about our deacons, um, and pay attention to the title, Thank God for Our Deacons. You know, sometimes we'll, we'll use that phrase, and, and sometimes we ought to really be careful how we use that phrase if, phrase if we use, well, we're this, you know, thankful that my team won or something like this. But I was deliberate when I came up with the title for this lesson, uh, Thanking God for Our Deacons. We have some tremendous deacons at this congregation. And I know that uh, for some of you who have always been here, you may not know that it's not always like this in every congregation. You don't perhaps know uh, how sublime our deacons are, but we really do, especially coming in from an outsider uh, who had no idea about you know, our technology and everything else that goes on, uh, didn't have to worry about it because we had men who were already on top of it, uh, who did their job and did it well. And uh, those are our deacons. And so I want to talk a little bit about deacons today. Uh, not just to the deacons that we have now and not just thanking God for them, but a little bit of overall about the office of a deacon. Um, perhaps in the future, as we appoint more deacons or the thinking about appointing more deacons, uh, kind of just tell us what it's all about, what the work of a deacon is all about. We'll just take a few moments to do that together uh, this afternoon. First of all, I want us to notice... The word deacon, diakonos, uh, in the Greek New Testament, and it means one who executes the commands of another, especially a master, a servant, attendant, or minister. So it can you mean a lot of things, really, depending upon the context in which it's used. Look at this. This is an interesting thing. This Greek word is used 31 times in the New Testament. 20 times it's translated as minister, and I just put a couple examples of each one up there as minister. You'll see it sometimes translated minister. Eight times as servant, Matthew 22, 13, John 12, 26, and other places as well. And then three times as deacons, Philippians 1, 1, and 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 and 12. Here are some other interesting things, and I don't have this on the PowerPoint, but maybe you just want to be thinking about this. Sometimes... Government officials, Romans 13, 4, uh, this word is used regarding them, a government official. It could be a servant of the government. Uh, Jesus is called a diakonos, Romans chapter 15, verse 8, servant, minister. Uh, Paul and Apollos were also called this, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 5. Uh, Paul was an apostle, uh, Apollos was a preacher, yet they were both servants, and so, uh, what can we learn from all of this? Well, here it is. The word was sometimes used in a general sense. If we ask this question, how many ministers do we have here at the Forest Hill Church of Christ? Raise your hand if you're a minister here. Ah, oh, some of you aren't ministers. I'll talk to you afterwards. How many of you are servants here? All right, it's the same thing, isn't it? How many of you are deacons here? Okay. Hmm, interesting. The number got down there at the last one. So we've learned some, something from this. Uh, it was used at certain times in a specific sense to talk about special servants within a congregation. Notice just two examples, and we won't, well, let's actually do, turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Kind of just show you here in, in one chapter, or one book anyway, um, two examples that tell you how this word is used sometimes. 1 Timothy chapter 4 Verse 6, if you instruct the brethren in these things, you will be a good minister of Jesus Christ. There's that word. It's a minister of Jesus Christ. It's a generic sense. Talking to Timothy, the evangelist, if you do this, you'll be a good diakonos. You'll be a good 
servant. You'll be a good minister of the gospel of Christ. And then in 1 Timothy chapter 3, the previous chapter, chapter 3, verse 8, likewise deacons must be reverenced, not double, double tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, and so on and so forth. In the same book, one is used in a generic sense, and all another time it's used in a specific sense, talking about specific workers within the church. So, how do we know that this is a special office at all? How do we know that this is, is, is something that we designate only certain people to be at, as deacons in this congregation, since it's used so often in a general sense? Well, think about this. First Timothy 3 mentions the office of a deacon, and then lists certain qualifications that not everybody has to hold in order to be a faithful member of the church. For example, uh, the husband of one wife. Can you be single and be a good servant of Christ? Well, obviously you can. But when it comes to serving as the role in the role of a deacon of a particular congregation, well, you need to be married. So we know that it's sometimes used in a very specific sense. Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 separates deacons from elders and saints. If it was always a generic thing, well, elders are also servants. Saints are also servants, but it separates the offices. It talks about elders and deacons within a one congregation. And so what we're talking about is not the generic sense. All of us are ministers. All of us are, are servants. If we were speaking Greek today, all of us are diakonos. We are all servants. But what we're talking about is that specific office that's described oftentimes as elders and deacons, mentioned oftentimes with the office of an elder. What do deacons do? What do deacons do? Number one, deacons serve the local congregation. They serve the local congregation. Now just stop right there and, and, and just start thinking why we need to thank God for our deacons. They know going in that their job is going to be serving the local congregation. If you were going to a restaurant and the waiter comes up to you and says, listen, <laughs> my feet are killing me. Would you mind serving these next three tables? Well, you said, man, I didn't come here to serve. I came here to be served. That's your job is this. My job is this. Well, oftentimes, sometimes we take that attitude into places where we shouldn't. And one of those places is in the Lord's church. These deacons know, deacons in the Lord's church know right away that it's my job, if I am a deacon, to serve the local congregation. Number one, that's admirable if that's all we knew about them, isn't it? That's admirable right there. They know going in that their job is to serve the local congregation. But not only that, they serve in God's service. They serve in God's service. It's a little bit different than going to a restaurant and serving somebody else. These people in this office, these men, they serve in God's service. Number three, they carry out the assigned tasks given to them by the elders. The role uh, and work of deacons is to carry out the work assigned to them by the eldership. The elders uh, give them specific jobs to do. And it is their job then to carry out those duties. Now, it's not only that. They can see other areas uh, that are, are needed, and they can jump right in and do that. But, but their goal and, and desire is the elders tell us what area we need to work in, and they do that. And we're going to see why they do that and how it benefits the elders here in just a moment. Next, I love this one. They excel in greatness. Look with me to Matthew chapter 20, and I would be so tempted to take too much time in this passage. This is one of my favorites in Matthew chapter 20, because it tells us really what we ought to all strive to be. All of us ought to strive to be servants, but the deacons excel in service. Matthew chapter 20, uh, look at verse 26. You remember this. Uh, in chapter 20, the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. That always gets me. And Matthew's the only one that tells us, hey, mommy, would you go and ask Jesus to do us a favor? When he comes into his kingdom, make one of us be on the right and the other one left. And so the mommy goes on behalf of her boys. And it's just an interesting thing. But what they were, were they wanted? They wanted positions of greatness. You let me put me in a, in a position where I can tell other people what to do. 
I don't want to have to do anything. I just want to have a position where I can tell everybody else what to do. It seemed like James and John, that was what their attitude was, and that's what Jesus addresses. But then watch this, Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 and 27. Yet it shall not be among you. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Verse 28, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. They are servants. All of us are to be servants, but deacons excel in it. Excel in it. They take a role that makes them necessarily, by fulfilling the qualifications of this role, to be a servant and take a servant status. Now we may be thinking, well man, are you trying to talk people into being a deacon or out of being a deacon? But people who are prepared to be a deacon, this is exciting to them. Because this is the people that they are. They are servants at heart and they excel in this. And that's why they are so great. Because they admittedly go in knowing, hey, my role here is not over the flock as an elder. My role here is not to get in front of the congregation every Sunday and address them from God's word. My role here is not this or that. My role is to serve this congregation and to take a position, an office, if you will, of servitude. And that's pretty awesome, isn't it? Thank God for our deacons. All Christians, as we've said, are to serve one another, but they excel in it. While all Christians are servants, deacons are a special class of servant. They are selected by the congregation. Right there's another good thing. And, you know, it can be done in different ways, and I'm not sure exactly how it's, it's done here, but oftentimes the elders will think of some men that, you know, hey, these guys have proven themselves, like to put them before the congregation and let the congregation uh, offer any objections if there are any, and usually there aren't because the elders have worked with these men in the past, and, and uh, then these, but, but just stop right there and, and think about this. You know, when, when they were selecting me as a, as a preacher, I don't know all that went in on it, but most preachers, when you go and select them, um, how well can this guy speak? Is he going to be a problem, you know, causer or a problem solver? And just maybe different things like that. How organized is he and whatever else goes into selecting a preacher? I've never done it, actually, so I don't really know. I've only been on this side of it. But when you're going to select elders, well, you know, uh, what, what do elders have? What do we want this man to have? What qualifications does he have to make him serve? Well? To be selected as a deacon, what a compliment to even be thought of by the elders, by the church. You know, this man has demonstrated himself to be a wonderful servant of God. I can't think of much more of a compliment than that, can you? I would rather be that than a good speaker, wouldn't you? I would rather be that than, than, than just about anything else on this earth. And that's what, that's what a deacon is known for. Thank God for our deacons. They are given these special assignments by the elders. They're required to meet certain qualifications. And we started to do that. Let's turn back over to 1 Timothy chapter 3. The first one, and, and it's, it's listed in the name. And so if, if, if we were putting this in our vernacular, if any man serve in the office of a servant. <laughs> so it's the, the, the first qualification is actually given in the name. But look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. And let's uh, read some of the qualifications. This lesson is not about going through each of these qualifications. But I do think they need to be read Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to, to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience. But let these also first be tested. In other words, how good of a servant are you? Are you a servant? Do you have a servant's heart? Would you do well in this? Then let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Then verse 11, likewise, their wives must be reverent, not slanderers, temperate, faithful in all things. Let deacons be the husbands of one wife, ruling their children and their own house as well, 
For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Isn't that beautiful? Let me read that last part. For those who have served well as deacons obtain for themselves a good standing and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. They go into the office knowing that they are going to be servants. But what's the greatest thing you can be on this earth? Same thing Jesus was. He was a servant. So let's think about this. How often do we truly think about our deacons? How often do we truly think about our deacons? And, and this is not only here this is all over the brotherhood in places that i've that i've been uh we thank god for our elders and we ask and there's nothing wrong with that we need to do that ask god to give them wisdom help them make wise decisions we often thank god for our preachers uh the work that they do but who do you think out of those three do you think gets left out the most i left them out just now deacons do you know when we think of deacons the one time out of a hundred, something doesn't go right. <laughs> Is that true or not? But that's their office. That's, that's their office. And they know this going in. They work behind the scenes. They'll, they'll work the, the jobs that, that need to be done, assigned to them by the elders. And they can do that 51 Sundays out of the month. But that one Sunday, hey, who's supposed to be teaching this class? Hey, uh, what's going on with the PowerPoint? Hey, what's going on with this, with that? About the only time they ever truly get recognized is when something doesn't go right. And that's not, that's not good, is it? And I know we already all appreciate our deacons here. I'm not, I'm not saying that we don't. But I'm hoping that we appreciate them more and more and more and more for what they do. If you are a deacon, a true deacon, listen carefully to this. It's not because you have the title deacon above your name. That's not what makes you a deacon. I've known a lot of people who've had that title, but aren't true deacons because they aren't servants. Deacons are workers. If you're not working, then you're not a true deacon. But if you are a servant of God, if you have uh, been approved of by the congregation to be in this office and you are truly working in your place, you are a great servant of God, and God takes notice of that and will bless you for that. They serve the local congregation. As we've said, under the elders, uh, they serve in different areas. Let's just close with this. Um, I serve under the elders. They serve in various um, areas. You know, oftentimes we get the idea, well, the elders serve in the spiritual uh, areas and deacons serve in the physical. And we, and we limit them and relegate them to that. That's not the case at all. Let's look at a couple of passages regarding that. Uh, when uh, the elders, of course, are given the charge to oversee the flock, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 2, elders are the ones who rule over the congregation, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5. Deacons like us and like everybody else are under their oversight of the elders. The elders give the deacons the assignments, not vice versa. But let's think about this. And the principle, I think, in Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4, although this is probably not the first time deacons were uh, appointed, that word is used and comes into play here. Notice what took place uh, in, when the apostles and these special servants in Acts chapter 2. You remember uh, they were wanting the apostles to spend more time focusing on the widows who were in need. And the apostles instead said, you, you choose you out uh, men of faithful report and gave them qualifications from this and let them see to this task. This, this was theirs. And this was, of course, a physical matter. And then the apostles concentrated on more spiritual matters. But other matters were turned over to faithful servants. But think what the elders would be if the elders were constantly bogged down with the church building or with helping those in, in need while delinquent or sick and weak members were being neglected. Uh, think about this, for example. When it came to uh, sending relief to certain congregations, you remember who they sent that relief to? They sent it to the elders. It was physical help, but it went to the elders. 
Oftentimes, however, the deacons were given spiritual things to do within a congregation. Uh, Acts chapter 11, verses 27 through 30, the contribution to physically help the Palestinian Jews, like I said, were sent to the elders, not the deacons. When Paul wanted to instruct about oversight in the church in Ephesus, he called for the elders, not the deacons. There's nowhere in the New Testament where deacons are said to have oversight of anything, but they were oftentimes involved in spiritual matters, things that truly mattered. What is um, pure and undefiled religion? Taking care of the orphans, taking care of the widows. Now, is that physical? Yes. Is that spiritual? Yes, it is. Um, but deacons are often involved in spiritual matter, matters as, as well. Um, they're just, I'm having to skip a lot here. Uh, you know, in other places, deacons are seen as junior elders. Um, often in some denominations, they won't have elders, but they'll have deacons, like a, like a deacon board. Uh, the Bible never says anything about that. Um, if you are a deacon, let's close with these thoughts. What are some of the pitfalls? Well, number one, to like the title. <laughs> we've, we've just shown becoming a deacon is not about getting a title. If we really remembered what that word means, servant, who's going to sign up for that? It takes a certain kind of man to do that, doesn't it? And so it's not about the title. It's about the work that you do. It's not about being appointed a deacon just to receive honor. It's not appointing deacons to help them become more faithful. You become a deacon because you have been tested. You have proven yourself already to be faithful and to be a great servant. Paul said, let them first be proved, not show potential, but first be proved. Uh, one of the major pitfalls that I've seen, and in, in probably you have as well, appointing um, men into the office who are not prepared for the office. Men who do not have the heart of a servant. Men who have a difficult time being instructed what to do. Men who have more aspirations than to be a servant. Now, we've said some pretty powerful stuff there, and I hope that you were listening. If you qualify as a deacon, a true deacon, all you really want to do is to be a servant. And lest we think that that's a demeaning thing to say, Jesus says that's where greatness is found. We have some wonderful deacons here, and God willing, in the future, we'll have more deacons. And I wanted these young men to think about this. You know, it is the case that oftentimes people are deacons before later on that they are elders, but you don't go into the deaconship thinking, boy, this is my first step. This is the minor leagues, and then I'm going to make it to the major leagues someday. And I want you young people especially to listen to this because we're looking at, at future deacons here. The greatest thing that you can do is to serve other people. And when you are okay with that, then you're qualified not only to be a deacon, which is a wonderful thing, but you receive the accolades, not always of the rest of us, but Christ takes notice of that. Be a servant, be a servant, be a servant. Deacons, we are so thankful to you uh, for all that you've done. And I know I jumped around there a lot towards the end because I had to skip a bunch of things that I had. Should have just made this a two or three part lesson and maybe we still will. But deacons, we are so thankful for you and we want you to know that. And it's not just when something goes wrong. Uh, we're thankful for you all the time. And hopefully um, we've been reminded of that today and to think about our deacons more often and show them appreciation and thank God for them.
thank God for them. Let me tell you something. These guys have saved me so many times since February 3rd that you don't know anything about. They saved me so many times. Uh, just make things so much easier for me uh, when I had no clue what I was doing with that camera up there and everything that goes with that and the technology that's involved here and then other aspects. Um, and I could just go on and on. I'm going to start rambling if I'm not careful. But we need to thank God for our deacons. And I know that you do. But let's keep on remembering them. Deacons, we do appreciate you. We love you. And we thank God for you. Let's pray. Our Father, as we close this lesson, we want you to know we are so grateful for your wisdom to come up with a special office, a special work called deacons in the church. We're so grateful, God, not only for the deacons that we have here, but the deacons that serve the church all over this world. Not only are we thankful for our deacons, but we're also thankful for their wives and children. We know this is a qualification for them, and so if they are deacons, they have awesome wives as well. And so, God, we thank you for, for both of them. We thank you for their families. And we pray, dear God, that you'll bless our men here. And we pray that they'll not grow weary in well-doing. We know that they are asked a lot of. They do so much, especially beside, behind the scenes. They don't get always the recognition they deserve. But, God, we know that you know just how valuable they are to the church here and to the church all over the world. So, God, we ask you, please bless them. Give them strength. Give them courage. And, Father, we're just so thankful for the men and their wives and their families that we have here. We pray, Father, that we'll always appreciate the wisdom of the organization of the church, and especially tonight, this afternoon, about our deacons. In Jesus' name, amen. If you are not a New Testament Christian today, won't you become one? Uh, we have men who would love to study with you. If you still have more questions, I would love to. Evan would love to. Our elders would love to. But you know what? Every one of our deacons would too. So if we can help you in any way, please let us know. Uh, if you're ready to obey the gospel now, we can do that. Do you believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Are you willing to repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized into Christ? Let us do that today. Or perhaps at one time you obeyed the gospel, but you've not been living as you should. Won't you come home? Let us pray with you and for you.